stand by. Uh, we're experiencing uh, some stuff. From estranged brothers and secret siblings to blooming romances, there's quite a few trolly relationships to go over in DreamWorks' latest Trolls movie. Let's see which ones have the best shot at making it work and which ones have a ton of room for improvement. I'm Samantha with Wicked Binge, and this is Trolls Band Together Relationships. Healthy to toxic. Milkshakes to celebrate. Spoilers for the new film ahead. As always, we're starting off with the healthiest relationships before working our way down. Truly, there is no better way to start this list than with Branch and Poppy. Honestly, the best compliment that we can give these two is that they always come off as best friends first and foremost. Yes, this film officially marks Branch and Poppy as boyfriend and girlfriend, and as such, we get both the occasional awkward moment, as well as a big kiss between them. But beyond the subtle romance, these two feel like each other's person, or rather, <coughs> troll. Sure, Poppy can sometimes be a bit pushy and excitable while Branch tends to roll his eyes at some of Poppy's antics, but on the other hand, it's Poppy who helps Branch open up while Branch helps Poppy stay grounded. They support each other without hesitation. And what's more, they understand each other incredibly well. The best example of this is when Branch lashes out at Poppy, accusing her of eventually leaving him like his brothers did. Brother! Correction. Used to be my brother. In almost any other film, this would probably result in a cliche fight and temporary breakup. But while Poppy is indeed hurt by the statement, she still calmly takes his hand and reminds him of their bond and how they've never left each other behind before. Once he hears this, Branch immediately apologizes, and the two are able to move on together, their bond reinforced. It's a scene that's simple yet beautiful, and it truly speaks to how far these two have come since the first film. Getting our silver medal of healthiness is the brotherly relationship between Floyd and Branch. Being the closest in age to each other, as well as the two youngest members of Brozone, Floyd and Branch easily have the strongest bond, as well as the least amount of tension out of any of the brothers. Floyd is the only one to actually comfort and give some advice to Baby Branch before his first concert, and later on is the only one who actually talks with him before leaving instead of simply walking out without a goodbye. As such, it's not much of a surprise when Branch almost immediately agrees to the mission when he hears that it's Floyd who's in trouble. It's even sweeter when they finally reunite, since Floyd is the only one who sees Branch for the man he's become, instead of patronizing him and only seeing him as the baby brother. It's a shame these two didn't get more screen time, but for what we did get, it was able to say a lot. But speaking of shining sibling examples, our bronze medal of healthiness is going to the surrogate sisterhood of Poppy and Bridget. Like with Branch and Poppy, it's just nice to see the relationship between these two grow from the first movie, going from an impromptu friendship to a genuine sisterhood, with the two of them just caring about each other a ton. We see at the start of the film that Poppy ends up being the best maid of honor ever to Bridget, giving her a truly memorable dress for her wedding day. Bridget also doesn't get mad when her wedding gets interrupted. If anything, she's kind of into all the drama. Later on, after Bridget hears that Poppy may be in trouble, she and Gristle are more than happy to put their honeymoon on hold to go help. In a film all about siblings, it's really awesome to see such a strong example of true sisterhood and how strong the bond between two sisters can be, even if they aren't related. Moving back over to the romantic side of things, next is Gristle and Bridget. These two are fun, plain, and simple. While Gristle can be a bit more awkward or quiet at times compared to Bridget's outgoing weirdness, the two are able to complement each other very well. Whether they are having fun on their honeymoon or spending what they think are their last moments making out, it's clear that these two are very much in love and, if their teamwork and the climax is any indication, are going to make for a great royal power couple for the Bergen Kingdom. Some of the flirtiness and jokes between them can be a bit risque. That, I didn't think we'd both be tied up on this honeymoon line comes to mind. Still, as strange and unexpected as it can be at times, it's clear that it's a dynamic that works for these two. But while those two can be a bit off, Spruce and Brandy are an odd couple in the best possible way. It's almost both poetic and sweet. Wow! Seeing the heartthrob of Brozone be the one to actually settle down and have weird troll Muppet hybrid kids. Daddy, Daddy, can I have a cookie? Brandy and Spruce are a very quirky couple that still manage to find bits of romance between all the work they have to do to keep both their beachside business and their chaotic family afloat. 
They split the work as evenly as possible, and when Spruce has to leave Brandy alone with everything so he can go save his brother, Brandy doesn't hold the sudden absence against him and only asks that he returns the favor and takes care of the kids when she goes on her yoga trip. We also see Brandy supporting Spruce's music career when Brozone gets back together for good, so it's clear that for as simple, domestic, and very busy as this couple's lives seem to be, there's still plenty of love between them. As for the other side of the estranged sibling's spectrum, we have to say that it was really nice seeing Poppy and Viva genuinely get along. It certainly helps that they have similar levels of sugar-fueled energy, allowing them to match each other's vibes perfectly. Unfortunately, there is one main difference between them, that being Viva's understandable fear of the outside world. As such, she does try to briefly keep Poppy from leaving, not wanting to risk losing her again. Thankfully, Poppy doesn't hold this against Viva and even invites her to come with them, only for Viva to decline. But as Poppy herself says, siblings show up for each other. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and that's just what Viva ends up doing when she meets Gristle and Bridget, getting confirmation that the Bergens don't eat trolls anymore. As a result, their little fight, if you could even call it that, is easily forgiven and forgotten about in the film's climax, where we get to see the two of them working and singing together once more. Finishing off the good is the casual friendship between Tiny Diamond, Poppy, and Branch. While Branch and Poppy have plenty of shared history and love for each other, Tiny Diamond is, well, he's just a baby. Given that he only goes on the mission for selfish reasons of wanting to prove to his dad that he can be a man, Tiny Diamond really doesn't have much of a bond with our main trolls at the start. He does offer Branch his ring pop pacifier, so that's something, we suppose. Me, <laughs> Thankfully, Tiny does prove himself to be a loyal friend when he follows Branch and Poppy after they walk out on Brozone, and he does his best to help them in the big car chase climax of the film. So even if it's not the deepest friendship around, it's still a fairly steady one in our opinion. Moving on, we have the relationships that could use some work but aren't completely terrible just yet. Welcome to the gray area. Starting off, just barely making it in here, is the friendship between Floyd and Crimp. It's hard to really call this a friendship per se, more like these two are both in a terrible situation and really have no one else to talk to. For what it's worth, Floyd did sympathize with Crimp, feeling bad for her whenever she got locked in a closet or verbally abused. Crimp, meanwhile, may have technically been an accomplice to his capture in that she just stood by while Floyd got his talent sucked away, we acknowledge that at her size and lack of power, there really wasn't a ton that she could have done, regardless of whether or not she actually tried. It should also be pointed out that Crimp had to be tricked into making the talent-sucking shoulder pads, indicating that there's a chance she would have straight up refused to be actively harmful towards Floyd if she had a choice in the matter. For these reasons, we see it as a pretty decent relationship, even if it's formed more out of shared situational trauma than anything else. When it comes to business partners, though, probably the best example we have is Viva and Clay. These two are co-leaders of the Putt-Putt Kingdom, with Viva being its fun-loving queen and Clay being its serious business guy and accountant. It is so fantastic, amazing to see other trolls! They get along well enough and seem to be decent friends, but they don't seem particularly close. Clay does know Viva's backstory, but he shares it behind her back and seems to see her trauma more as an obstacle than as something to sympathize with. This is further shown in that, immediately afterwards, Clay tries to sneak out of the kingdom with his brothers, not even bothering to try and convince Viva to just let them leave until she confronts them. Like with Poppy, Viva does try to force them to stay, but Clay actively goes against her by opening the kingdom doors himself. For what it's worth, there doesn't seem to be too much tension between them afterwards, and gives Given the rest of the movie, we feel like Viva would understand that Clay really was acting for the sake of his sibling, something she would now completely get. Still, these two really do seem more like just strictly business partners and maybe casual friends than anything else. Tensions and conflict can be tricky, and Brozone as a whole is filled with it. Made up of John Dory, Clay, Floyd, Spruce, and Baby Branch, this literal band of brothers has its fair share of communication issues. Outside of Branch, each Brozone brother has their own varying levels of selfishness. It's one thing to try and seek out your own happiness or dream, 
but to not even bother staying in touch or visiting, or, in the case of the three eldest brothers, not giving a proper goodbye, that's just cold. What's worse is that Clay, Spruce, and John Dory were focused so much on completing the mission and getting back to their own lives that they didn't even acknowledge how much they hurt Branch, and that they were still treating him as the naive baby brother. As such, you understand why Branch would lash out at them, as well as why Floyd later on gets very quickly annoyed with their bickering. Thankfully, for all the struggles this family has when the chips are down, the eldest Brozone members are still willing to set their pride aside and admit their faults for the sake of rescuing each other and finally finding harmony. Finishing up the gray, let's take a look at the specific relationship between John Dory and Branch. Given the huge age gap between these two brothers, with one being the oldest in the family and the other being the youngest, it's no real surprise that they have a hard time understanding each other. Given his bossy nature and tendency to be the leader, John Dory seems to be the one who patronizes Branch the most. Let's Branch, meanwhile, struggles to even give his oldest brother a chance at first, being obviously hurt by him but refusing to open up. Even after they start getting along better, they still bicker and don't have much of a bond. Still, they love each other despite this estrangement, with John Dory even mentioning that he had gone looking for Branch at one point in the past and had no idea if Branch was even still alive or not. In the end, it's nice to see John Dory actually respect Branch for who he is, giving him the leadership reins within their group, and even allowing him to write a song for them. It may be several years late, but at least it's a good step in the right direction. We finally arrived at the relationships that while maybe not a total lost cause, or at least not in the case of our bronze winner, they could still easily be seen as totally toxic. For our bronze medal of toxicity, we're giving it to the shallow friendship of sorts between Veneer and Floyd. Like with Crimp, Floyd forms this friendship out of both convenience and circumstances. He sees Veneer being treated badly by his sibling and sympathizes with him, even letting him know that Veneer doesn't have to take that garbage. In exchange, Veneer is able to feel somewhat bad for Floyd, not wanting to see the little guy be destroyed for the sake of his and Velvet's fame. This, however, doesn't stop Veneer from still using Floyd's talent, either because he's too attached to fame, or because he doesn't want to upset Velvet by standing up to her. You'd think that there'd be a big moment where he does finally help save Floyd, but nope. Veneer doesn't even come clean about his and his sister's phoniness until after Brozone releases the perfect family harmony and frees Floyd themselves. It sucks that they couldn't be actual friends, but given how chill and forgiving Floyd seems to be, maybe there's still a chance for an actual bond to form between them, after Veneer gets out of prison, of course. Next up, the silver medal of toxicity is going to siblings Velvet and Veneer. While they can be a bit cliche at times, you sort of understand how this relationship came to be as well as its pitfalls. Velvet is very much the leading twin, often bossing Veneer around and, as he says, trying to change him into what she wants him to be for the sake of their shared careers. Each time Veneer tries to get her to take a step back from what they're doing, Velvet just brushes him off. Veneer says he loves his sister, but it's also made pretty clear that he's somewhat afraid of her, hence why he's only willing to finally stand up to her when they're already backed into a corner. It doesn't help that Velvet can be pretty manipulative when she wants to be, either by throwing a fit or playing up her sweet sister side. There are certainly worse animated siblings out there. But in terms of this movie and all its examples of siblings and family, they are absolutely the unhealthiest sibling relationship. But if there's one thing Velvet and Veneer have in common besides a love of fame, it's absolute contempt for their poor assistant who really did nothing wrong. As such, the relationship between Crimp and the twins is our pick for most toxic relationship. All Crimp wants is to do her best at her job as the twins assistant, wanting to make them happy and help them be successful. But no matter what she was, Velvet and Veneer couldn't care less about her. They do what they can to make her job harder. They insult and demean her, brush off her suggestions, throw her in closets, and at one point, Velvet even tricks her into making what is essentially a troll talent sucking death machine in the form of tacky shoulder pads. Seeing all this, it's a huge relief when Crimp is finally given the opportunity to fight back against them to the point of putting their handcuffs on herself. In all honesty, that's the one good thing about this relationship, seeing it finally end. Best of luck to you, Crimp, wherever your talents take you to next. <laughs>